Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. Uh, <clears throat> it is Sunday, April 19th. Uh, I invite you to uh, check out the bulletin for this service that can be found in the description beneath this uh, video on YouTube or in the description on Facebook. Uh, you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and you can uh, find the bulletin there underneath this video as well. Um, I call your attention to the uh, announcements found on the back of the bulletin. The deadlines for the Junior High Jubilee and Montreat Youth Celebration for Senior High Students, uh, trips offered by the Presbytery of Arkansas, have extended their deadlines for registration. Both trips have a few openings left. If you are interested or have an interested youth, please contact Zach Cosner, me, for more information. Uh, online archives of our services can be found at Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are on our website, www.centralprespb. A neighbor to neighbor is looking for donations to help make sack lunches. They're currently open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays to feed the community. Uh, contact them for more information. Trinity Village is still asking for donations of canned drinks and snacks for staff. Since vending machines can't be serviced during their lockdown, please contact them for more information as well. <clears throat> Last but not least, least, CPC now has online giving available. Check out our website and look for the Donate Now link. We take credit cards, debit cards, and checks. You can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly basis. Let us worship God. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord. Over powers and principalities, over all who determine, control, govern, or finance the affairs of humankind, Jesus Christ is Lord. Of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against, and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church, beyond our most excellent, excellent theologies, and in the quiet corners of our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us draw near to God with sincerity of heart, in full assurance of faith, our guilty hearts sprinkled clean, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us confess our sins before God and one another, first in unison, using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Wondrous God, you have broken the power of sin and death, and by your great mercy, you have given us new birth into a living hope. This we proclaim. This we want to believe, but seeds of doubt grow quickly in our hearts. Fear chokes off confidence and prevents us from seeing, and, or excuse me, and prevents us from receiving your spirit. We multiply our sorrows by worshiping what we see and hear more than you. Our delight, our delight and salvation. O oh God, in your great mercy, grant us this peace that passes understanding. Forgive us and draw us close to you, that we may breathe deeply of your presence and find in you the fullness of joy. Amen. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first reading this morning is the 16th Psalm. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble. 
in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our second reading <clears throat> comes from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning with the 19th verse and proceeding through verse 31. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. That hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. As this morning's lesson from John opens, we learn that it was evening on that first Easter day, and that the disciples are gathered behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. Surely those who have gathered have heard Mary Magdalene's news that she had seen the Lord, and yet there was no joy, no hope, nothing that the disciples could find to alleviate their fear, and so they had shut themselves off from the world. They sat behind locked doors, afraid. In some ways, I think that is a pretty adequate description of the Church of Jesus Christ today. 
To be sure, we can only gather today behind locked doors and via technology for fear of spreading or contracting COVID-19. The good news of resurrection may be music to the ears of all the faithful, but we still live in a world where that news goes unheard and unheeded. So even if we were not facing a global pandemic, we would have to acknowledge, if we were truly honest with ourselves, that with each passing day, we give in a little bit more to our fears. We all cower behind locked doors because we fear violence and ill will of those intent on doing harm. We are suspicious of strangers. We worry about the future. We who have such wonderful news to share with a world so desperate for good news are all too often silenced or paralyzed by our fear. Even the psalmist's opening words this morning acknowledge that fear. The psalmist's prayer implicitly acknowledges what we all know from experience, that far too much of our world, far too many people experience this world as anything but safe. For many, the world is a horror of devastation and destruction, vulnerability and sorrow. And still the psalmist is confident about the God whom he worships, for this is a God who counsels and instructs and will not abandon us. In an unsafe world, God is a God of protection, preservation, and refuge. And so it is that we are told that the risen Christ appears to his disciples behind locked doors and says to them, peace be with you. Seems like such an ordinary greeting. But what an extraordinary gift that turns out to be. He who conquered sin and death now set out to, conquers, to conquer his disciples' fear. And after he says, peace be with you, he shows his disciples his hands and side. And as John reports, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. How many times have we heard someone ask, or even ask ourselves when burdened by fear, where are you, God? Where are you in this world so torn by violence? Where are you in the suffering of life? Where are you as so many people die alone in ICUs in this pandemic? Well, the wounds of Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior, give us the answer. God is present in, not absent from, our agony. But the deeper truth of the cross is that God is present for us and the whole creation. Through our Lord's life, suffering, death, and resurrection, God participated in our own being, bringing healing and peace in ways we cannot fully comprehend. And it is that peace which enables us to confront the terrors, real and imagined, of this world. Incidentally, even though Thomas is often singled out and berated for doubting, we should point out that he is only asking for the same assurance that the other disciples had received. Thomas, too, would be called upon to spread the good news. And like the other disciples, he needed to be shown that the good news actually existed. He needed an understanding of peace. I'm reminded of the story of a king who once offered a grand and noble prize to any artist in his realm who could paint the best picture of peace. Many artists submitted their work, and the king, looking at all the pictures, narrowed his choice down to two. One painting was that of a calm lake, perfectly reflecting the towering mountains all around it and the blue sky filled with fluffy white clouds. 
everyone who viewed this picture was sure that this was the perfect picture of peace. The other picture had mountains too, but these were rugged and bare, and above them was an angry sky from which rain fell and lightning struck, and down the side of one of the mountains tumbled a foaming waterfall. Didn't look like a picture of peace at all, but when, you, when the king looked closer, he saw behind that waterfall a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. And in that bush, a mother bird had built her nest. There, in the midst of all of this angry water and chaos, sat a mother bird on her nest in perfect peace. The king awarded the prize to the artist of the second picture because he said, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise or trouble or fear. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. That is the real meaning of peace. And that's what Thomas himself sought that night. The gift of peace would prove to be very important to our Lord's disciples. So he says to them a second time when he greets them, peace be with you. And here we see the importance of that because he follows that with the words, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Think about that for a moment. Into this same violent world that had crucified Jesus, he now sends his disciples. And while we may view the church as a place where the faithful can find refuge from the world, it is clear that we are not intended to remain shut off from the world. We are sent as Jesus was sent, into the fear, into the violence, into this sinful and broken world. But the good news is we are not sent on our own. We are given the abiding and sustaining presence of God's Holy Spirit. And one thing that the Holy Spirit teaches us is that our faith depends not on our ability to touch Christ, but rather on his ability to touch us today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Jesus was talking about you and me when he uttered those words. And that's important too, because just like those first disciples, we today are sent by Jesus. And here is where we come to the value of one sent. He who left his peace among us sends us out to be ambassadors of that same peace. In a world where such peace is barely visible, if it is visible at all, we, the church, are called to stand boldly in the face of all fear. Whether it's the fear of dying or the fear of living, whether it's the fear of declining membership and financial resources, Wherever there is fear in the church, we are called upon to stand boldly and witness to the peace that surpasses all understanding. What if is a question that we can ask over and over again. What if we try and no one listens? What if we try and we run into hardship and pain? What if we try in this broken world and are only dashed against the stones of hatred and abuse? Or what if we reached out to others and they indeed joined the church and suddenly our positions in the church were threatened? 
What if someone dared to sit in the very pew where we have sat all our lives? What if someone dared to have a new idea or a new way of doing something that we've never considered before? What if in being bold, our faith were actually challenged and we were suddenly drawn out of our comfort zones? We can spend a lot of our time, indeed all of our time, engaged in the what-ifs of life. But if we do so, we are only giving in to our deep-seated fears. Little wonder, then, that through the locked doors and right into the middle of their fears stepped the risen Christ who announced to those disciples, Peace be with you. We are entrusted with the awesome task of proclaiming forgiveness. However, we become so blinded sometimes by things like morality that we forget this awesome responsibility. One commentator, one commentator put it this way when he said, the church is not in the morals business. The world is in the morals business, quite rightfully, and it has done a fine job of it all all things considered. The history of the world's moral codes is a monument to the labors of many philosophers, and it is a monument of striking unity and beauty. C.S. Lewis said anyone who thinks the moral codes of mankind are all different should be locked up in a library and be made to read three days worth of them. He would be bored silly by the sheer sameness. But what the world cannot get right is forgiveness. And that's the church's real job. We are in the world to deal with the sin which the world can't turn off or escape from. We are in the business of telling the world what's right and wrong, yes, but also of offering to a world which knows all about right and wrong forgiveness for its chronic unwillingness to take its own advice. The minute we even hint that morals and not forgiveness is the name of our game, we corrupt the gospel and we run headlong into nonsense. Because then the church becomes not Ms. Forgiven Sinner, but Ms. Right. Christianity becomes the good guys in here versus the bad guys out there, which is pure nonsense, because the church is nothing but the world under the sign of baptism, of forgiveness. As the Father sent Jesus to forgive sin, so does he send us to do the same. He who mirrored the love of God for all people sends us out to reflect that same love. He whose life epitomized the words, grace and mercy, sends us out to be gracious and merciful. He who conquered sin and death so that we might live eternally sends us out in the power of the Holy Spirit to radiate light and life. And he who showed himself to those early disciples that they might fully believe sends us into the world to show all whom we meet the power of Christ working in our lives and to tell them the good news. So what is the value of one cent? Perhaps the best answer to that question can only be given by the people whom we touch along the way. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please stand and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, at this time, uh, let us return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which can be done by going to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and clicking the Donate Now button. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and to share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves, for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns. Uh, we continue to uh, hold those uh, who are affected by the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, those who have lost loved ones, who, uh, those who are uh, caring for the uh, sick and, um, and affected, uh, those who, are, uh, who have contracted the disease, and uh, those who have family members in the uh, uh, before-mentioned groups. Um, we also uh, continue to pray for uh, those who are affected by the uh, terrible storms that came through the community um, this past Sunday evening. Um, some of us are still without power um, this morning. Um, I actually am one of those people. Um, we uh, continue to uh, pray for those who lost loved ones during that storm. Um, and we uh, pray for those who are uh, currently uh, throughout uh, the uh, state and the um, the region who uh, are working on restoring uh, power to those who have lost uh, that power. Um, we also continue to uh, pray for um, uh, the congregation uh, to continue to be able to uh, uh, receive the blessings that they need uh, through the services that we are providing online. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please be with those who we mentioned here tonight, those people who are currently uh, dealing with the results of the recent storms, uh, those who are affected or um, providing care for those who are dealing with the coronavirus and those, those families who, are, um, who have lost loved ones. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.